Thank you so much for being here tonight. So good to see you. Man, it seems like forever since I've seen you. I miss Sunday. I miss being with you. I miss the time. Let me just share a testimony with you about where we are right now. Um, and this has so much to do with you guys and what you've done. We were, I was with our pastors out in Iowa, Nebraska, and the region out there. The average church out there for our denomination is between 20 and 30 people that are there in small congregations. The average age of the pastor was 152. <laughs> I just want to, I want to help you. Um, but in all sincerity, the average age was probably in their 70s. Uh, we had met one pastor, uh, 81 years old, and he's afraid to retire from being a pastor because of the simple fact of he doesn't think anybody will be able to take his church. And so he doesn't want his church to close down in the region that they're in. And the ones that we have been mentoring over the past three years, there's a young man named Brad Riddle. Uh, he took over his grandfather's and his dad's church, and he's the third pastor in his family from that church. They were running between uh, 30 to 40 people. In the past four Sundays, they've been over 200 people and what God is doing that, and people are getting saved every single week. And because of your financial investment, because uh, just the things that we've been able to do around here, uh, we had another opportunity to speak into a church in Des Moines, Iowa, and be in that place in the capital. Uh, if you noticed some of that last night on TV, you could see that. But just so much of what you're doing because of your faithfulness in tithing, in giving, in offerings, and everything that you're doing is making a huge difference. I thank God for what God is doing in Tiff County through us. But I'm also blessed to be a part of what he's doing through us in Iowa, in Nebraska, in Edinburgh, Scotland, in Jerusalem, in different places that we're at because of your faithfulness in tithing and giving. So just thank you so much. Make your next steps. We were in our small groups last night, and we were just reminding everybody about the simple fact of we want you, and we love it where you are right now, but how many of you know we can all grow another step this year? <laughs> we can make another step, and March the 13th, we'll have a, our baptism service. And if you haven't been baptized yet, this is a great time to be baptized. We want you to grow in prayer. We want you to grow in Bible reading. We want you to grow in every area of your life. And so just to let you know about that, March 13th, also growth track the first Sunday and everything that's being done there. So thank you so much. And I also want to say this publicly. How many of you know your pastor could be away in Iowa because you've got such a great team here? that honored the service, did worship, preached the word. We're back in Children's Church. How many of you know, some of them won't hear it because they're in the Family Life Center, but you need to give them an ovation right now. I didn't even check until Monday or maybe Sunday night, but that doesn't count. But just wanted to make sure that you were good. And I know God did amazing things around here Sunday. So thank you so much for being who you are and what you're doing. I have a great privilege tonight. Um, and I'm just, I'm a little overwhelmed. And we were back there talking about before service. And a flood of min uh, memories came over my mind. We went to go relaunch and restart a church in Birmingham uh, 14 years ago now. And uh, we prayed, and God, we were. I told some of the story the other day about our church was in a flood zone. We were the drain of the flood zone. If you ever know what that is, that's where our church was located at. We did a lot of things during that time. But one of the most special things happened one night or one day when a young man that I had talked to earlier, prayed with earlier, came in to be part of our service, 18 years old. He eventually became my student pastor and the first person on staff with me. Now, I tell everybody now, uh, we were young and dumb, and I did a lot of things that I look back at and go, why in the world did we do that? But one of the very best decisions that we made was for Brandon Matthews to be our student pastor. 
God used him mightily to bring many people to Jesus Christ and also help us through the process. Uh, we didn't have any money, so every bit of work done on the church had to be done by us too, and then some more that came later. And we, ha- we have some good stories about that, none that we will share publicly, but we have some good stories about that. So I want you to welcome Brandon Matthews. He's going to do a great job for us tonight. Good evening, everybody. How are we doing? It's First Wednesday, so we're excited. I know if you're here on First Wednesday, it's because you're expecting something. You need something from Jesus tonight. Man, it's so good. It is such an honor. Look, it is, uh, Pastor, this is probably one of the greatest honors, and I, I don't say that out of lip service or what has to be said, but I say it because it's true. Um, tonight, I, I get to be with you, uh, and as he said, coming back from you know a long time ago now, it feels like forever, that what God did through this family in my life. At 18 years old, uh, one of the greatest things somebody can do is, is take a chance on you and believe in you. You know, sometimes you need people who believe in you just a little bit, and not just to say it, but to do it. And so I didn't grow up in a Christian home. As a matter of fact, um, my dad always thought church was about, you know, taking your money and never had a lot of good things to say about church. And he said about me, he said, you're probably either going to be a crook, a preacher, or a crooked preacher. That's what dad would say. <laughs> And so Pastor Todd took a gamble on an 18-year-old kid to come in and to care for what God had entrusted for his family to do. And so tonight it's an honor to stand here because I understand how much uh, your pastors care about you and they care about this place. So to be entrusted to be here and to speak to you is a big honor. Uh, Not only could I say so many things, and uh, hint taken, I won't share any of those stories publicly, uh, that I could say, but I I do want to say this. uh, My dad, who I spoke about, Uh, found a friend in Pastor Todd, one of the first pastors I ever saw that my dad trusted. And because of your friendship and the time that you poured into his life, my dad met Jesus, and I saw him begin to serve the Lord and tell the goodness of Jesus. Uh, Pastor Todd uh, preached my dad's funeral about 10 years ago uh, when my dad passed unexpectedly, and it was just would never be a debt forever Uh, for my life to stand here tonight because of what you invested in me and for my family. Uh, I'll never forget walking in one of the first times to see Pastor Todd to say that I wanted to be a part of something just like this, of what's happening right here in your church. As I walked into a little bitty room, uh, a little fellowship hall, and I saw that Pastor Todd had gone outside the walls and had brought in some kids that you probably wouldn't want to sit around the table with in their community. And he went to where they were, and he brought them in and fed them breakfast, carried those kids in his arms, and loved on those kids. And that's the day I knew that I wanted to be a part of something just like that. And I fast forward to see what God is doing here and watching all of you from the beauty of social media to see that the same heart that this family, your pastors, carry then is being instilled in what God is doing right here today. That God is consistent and God is faithful. And when God calls you to do something, you'll do what God's called you to do. In that little church of restarting, there were, there were no children at the time. I think the youngest person in the church was probably, you know, 50 years old, it felt like at the time. And that's not old. I'm just saying for a church to start over, you you need some kids, you need some life, you got to be able to reproduce something. And I'll never forget your pastors, Pastor Todd and Shanna say, uh, we got to have nursery. We need somebody to do nursery. And I remember people going, there's no kids. What what do we need nursery for? And I remember them saying, well, there's going to be kids. So there has to be nursery for when they arrive, speaking vision. And so for quite some time, Shanna, you were the nursery. You were the nursery department and served so faithfully. And I say that to say, church, your pastors are leading from who they are. What they say is not something that they just dream up. It's it's who they are. It is coming out of them. And I'm watching what you're doing with the upcoming Dream Center and what God has laid on the heart of this church to do. And I want to tell you that's the heart of Jesus. And so tonight what I want to do is I just want to pour into you what I feel like God would just say to us tonight to encourage you. 
I hope that you leave tonight just a little bit more in love with the vision of the house that God has put you in. And to understand that you're not here just following people, but you're following the voice of the Lord and the leadership that God has put here. Because God truly wants to do something through you, every single one of you. It's not on the leadership to do it all. It's for them to lead in the direction and all of us come in together to do something really incredible. That's the heart of Jesus. You see, Jesus knew about doing some things. Jesus knew about taking something from nothing and creating something that God wanted to see out of it. You see, the heart to say we're going to lead and we're going to do and we're going to create, that's the heart of God, and I think that's what he wants to do in this church tonight. If you're taking some notes, and I hope you are, because I've got some things that I want you to write down that I feel real passionate about tonight. <clears throat> we're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 5, and we're going to spend our time there tonight. And if I was going to give you a title, which I am, I would say, How to Float Your Boat. Tonight I want to teach you how to float your boat, the, the boat of this house, the boat of the vision of God that he's given you for us all to do together. Most of us in here probably know the story of the Titanic. If you don't, don't raise your hand because that's embarrassing. But you've at least probably seen Leonardo DiCaprio uh, in the long three-hour movie of uh, the Titanic. It was billed as the unsinkable ship. It's been nearly a hundred, over 100 years, just over 100 years since the Titanic sank. It was a modern marvel of the world. People lined up, bought all the tickets to experience this groundbreaking cruise ship. They signed up because of the beauty, because of the amenities, the food. It was an elite process to be a part of this first sailing. Everyone signed up because of what they were going to receive from this experience. However, history tells us that there was an undetected danger in the water. And what happened? The boat sank. Because of the undetected danger that they did not see and they did not prepare for, because they weren't prepared for what was to come, they had convinced themselves that there was nothing greater than the ship that they were on and there was nothing that could destroy it, but yet it sank to the bottom of the sea. A cruise is one of my favorite vacations. If you've not been on a cruise, you need to go on a cruise. And let me just tell you, don't go on the expensive cruise, okay? Let me just let me break this down for you. How many of you like to people watch? Any people watchers in here? If it paid money, you could sign me up. I would do it today. Now, my strategy for a cruise is the cheap cruises, and you go in hurricane season because it's super cheap. Now, if you're on a cheap cruise, let's just be honest. If we're on the bottom basement bargain of a cruise in hurricane season, I'm just going to say the crowd is very eclectic, it's a unique group of people. So when we all make our trip to the buffet, it's a dinner and a show just at the buffet. That's all I'm saying. I'm in the middle of it. I'm one of those weirdos as well. But the worst part about a cruise is the safety demonstration. Nobody signs up and says, you know what? I can't wait till the first day. When they cram us in those small spaces and they tell us how to put on a life jacket, you know, and they tell us where the boats are and all that good stuff. But you know, when a cruise starts to sink, when you've hit some undetected danger and you start taking on water, the amenities do not matter. It does not matter how good the entertainment is. It doesn't matter how full the buffet is. It does not matter how clean your room is and what your towel animal is for that day. What matters is where those life rafts are. Because those life rafts are what saves souls. Those life rafts are the difference between life and death. It's not on the brochure. People didn't sign up to say, I can't wait to see the life rafts. I hope I get to be in one of those. <laughs> Yet when there's undetected danger and water comes in and you start to sink, thank God for the life raft. Church, here's what I know is that there's people all around you that need healing, they need hope, and they need help. And this church was never created to be the cruise ship. It was never created to be the modern marvel of come and see what we have and what we can do. But this church is to be, the church is you and it's me, it's us collectively being who God has called us to be. We're the life raft so that when people are in danger and they're taking on water in their life, that this is the place of safety that is the difference between life and death. And so tonight, I want to say, how do we float the boat? Jesus knew a lot about boats. Look at it with me in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 
through 11. And here's what it says. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him, and they listened to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them there and were washing their nets. Their day was done. They were tired. But stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. And when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper, let down your nets to catch some fish. Master Simon replied, look, we've worked hard all last night. We didn't catch anything. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. And this time, notice this time, something changed. Something's different. This time, their nets were so full that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon, both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please forgive me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon and said, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Tonight, what would happen if we left everything and we started to follow Jesus? That's how we float the boat. That's how we achieve what God's called us to do. And tonight, I want to see God do that in our lives. Can we pray over God's Word tonight before we dive in? Father, I love you. I'm so honored. What a joy to be standing in this house. Not only because of the incredible pastors who lead this place. I know their heart. I know they love you, God. They've been so consistent for all these years in serving you and serving the vision of their life. But God, I'm so thankful for this house and the people that is the church because together we're what makes the difference. And I just pray tonight that every one of us are challenged. God, we're motivated, we're convicted tonight. God, to lean into you a little bit more so that we can grow a little bit deeper. Tonight, I pray for all the distraction, God, to be moved to the side. I pray for our feelings. I pray for any barrier that would stand in the gap of your voice tonight to be removed. God, open our ears that we hear your voice speak. Open our mind that we understand what it is that you want to say. And God, open our hearts that we're not just hearers of your word, but we're doers, and we leave this place changed by the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So a few things I want to give you tonight. Write these down. Uh, If you're not a note taker, totally cool. Just write it down anyway. I'm a guest. Number one, write this down. If we're going to float the boat, if we're really going to walk in purpose that God has called for us to do in your life, if you're going to achieve everything God's put on you in your personal walk with Jesus, in your family, in your business, and in this house, is number one, you need to open your boat. You need to open up your boat. What is your boat? It's your life. It's everything that you are. It's everything God created you to be, everything God entrusted you with. It is your skill set. It is your abilities. It is your inabilities. It is the relationships you have. It is the influence you have. It is the place that God has put you in. Your boat needs to be open. Luke 5 and 3 said Jesus stepped into one of the boats. See, this is when it began to change, when Jesus got into the boat. And Jesus said to its owner, push it out into the water. We're about to do something here. He got in the boat and began to tell him what to do, and then he sat down in the boat, and he taught the crowds from there. Notice what happened. These guys were done. They had already performed their duty. They had already been doing what they were responsible for doing, and yet one day, everything begins to change. Jesus shows up and says, Scoot over, let me in the boat, and Jesus just makes himself at home. Now, we think about Jesus in our context because we understand he's the Son of God. We understand that that, that he's the Savior of the world. But, But these people saw Jesus as a man, and they questioned a lot of these things. And Jesus got very personal. He moved in and said, scoot over, I'm coming on in. And see, I think the problem for us many times is we miss what God wants to do because we have filled our boat with so much stuff till there is no room for Jesus left. Our boat is full of everything but Jesus. If Saturday night is a question about what Sunday is going to happen, your boat is too full. Now, we're tired, and you're busy people, and we do all these things, but when we are questioning what we can do for God because we've made room for everything else, we got too many things in the boat. 
We need to play one less sport. We need to have one less hobby. We need to have one less bill so that we can give to the Lord in which He has called us to do. You see, many of us have hurts, we have habits, we have hang-ups, we have fears, we have failures, we have abuse that we have taken on. There are many people probably sitting in this room tonight, regardless of your age, that are still dealing with things that have been deeply rooted in your life since you were a child. It's never been discussed, it's never been said, it's never been dealt with, but yet that is sitting in your boat. But you know, when a boat begins to take on water, what is the first thing that they do? When a boat starts to sink, what happens? They begin to take everything that is unnecessary and they begin to alleviate some of the weight in which is in the boat. Because if you don't get rid of something, you're going to sink a whole lot faster. So you start looking in the boat and going, what is it that we can get rid of so that we can find life, so that we can live? I want to ask you tonight, what is in your boat tonight that you need to get rid of so that you can make more room for God to do what He wants in and through you. What depression, what hurt, what habit, what hang up, what excuse, what is in your life that you need to get rid of? Ask yourself this tonight, am I really willing to let Jesus get in my boat? Now we we say we are, of course. Yeah, it's Jesus. But how many of us are holding on to stuff and we got excuses why we can't serve, why we can't give, why we can't do, why we just feel like we're a little bit too inferior. Look, you're going, well, pastor, it's easy for you. You're a pastor. This is what you do. Listen, I didn't come from a Christian home. There's no pastors in my house. I'm no different than you standing right here other than just I was crazy enough to say, God, whatever needs to be out of my boat, take it out of my boat. And every time I fill it back up with the wrong stuff and God looks at me and says, hey, bud, you got your priorities messed up. Get it out. I got to go, okay, God, help me make room for you to be in my boat. I want to ask you a question. Is Jesus the master or is he the mate? In the boat of your life, is he the master or is he just another mate? you got to open your boat. Number two, write this down. you got to deepen your boat. See, some of us in here, we're breathing good. because Okay, whew, I'm so glad I know Jesus. I'm so glad that I, 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 that's not me. I'm, I'm glad I'm past that step. I said yes to Jesus a long time ago. Well, some of us were real good about Jesus sitting in the boat while we're still attached to the shore. But Jesus said something a little else. He got in the boat, and Jesus wasn't satisfied just sitting on the shore. We get real satisfied just sitting on the shore. We're really good armchair quarterbacks, but it's another thing to suit up and get in the game. Jesus, when he had finished speaking, said, Hey, man, this is a nice boat. But a boat is meant to float. A boat was never meant for the shore. This is great, but how about we go out where it's a little bit deeper? See, there's something about the deeper water. There's something about the extra. There's something about the unknown. There's something about the possibility when you move from the shore and you go into the deeper things. And then go out there and let your nets down to catch some fish. We've already done that. We've already prayed that prayer. You know, I used to go to church, and I prayed that one time, and it all got worse. But I know I need to be here because I don't want to go to hell. You know what I'm saying? I want want that, but I... So we're afraid to get back into the deep. But this time, do it to catch some fish. Hey, Jesus, we worked hard all last night. We didn't catch anything. Because of our disappointment, because of our comfort, because of our habits, we've gotten real good at sitting on the shore. Church, there's people all around us. They need healing, they need hope, and they need help. And they need a people with a dream to provide a place for people to experience life change in Jesus. See, we like Jesus as Savior, don't we? Because we want heaven and we don't want hell. I like that part. But there's something about moving from the Jesus as our Savior and moving past the Jesus as a religious tradition and then moving into Jesus as our Lord. See, there are many of us that we love Jesus and we love his church and he is our Savior, but we haven't transitioned to making him our Lord. How do we know if he's our Lord or if he's just our Savior? Well, if he's your Savior, then you feel good about eternity. But if he's your Lord, you're working hard getting the stuff out of the boat so you can push out into the deep so that you can catch some fish. Tonight, what are your excuses? We've all got excuses. We're good at excuses, aren't we? My son's five years old. He's, a, he's an in vitro baby. Uh, my wife uh, had ectopic pregnancy, and so we couldn't uh, have a child um, 
uh, without the help of in vitro. And so at the time, we'd early planted our church. And so I worked for Apple for two years, and it was just a process of God. I can tell you the whole story one day. But anyway, I worked for Apple. Turns out Apple had national health care to help pay for in vitro, up to three attempts. And it took us three times, and God gave us a baby. Apple paid for it, so go buy an iPhone or iPad today, and you're doing God's work. Okay, that's all I'm saying. My little boy, though, he's good at excuses, man. I think he's going to end up in jail if Jesus don't do something one day. He's only five because he's quick. You know, he's quick. You know, he'll tell me something really quick. I'll, I'll say, hey, bud, uh, I told you five times to do that. Hey, Dad, I know why. I couldn't hear you. Dad, I got an ear infection. I, I, got an, I think that's what's wrong, Dad. I got an ear infection. I'm like, bud, you're sh- straight to prison. You're doing good. Like, you, you, we got to get this worked out. See, we're, we're, we're conditioned. I didn't teach him how to make excuses. He was born that way. And every one of us, we're better at making excuses than we are doing what God's asked us to do. So instead of making excuses, what would just happen if we say, hey, we worked hard last night, but Jesus, if you say so, I'm going to go out and I'm going to deepen my boat. Is it possible that you're still sitting in the shallow, coming up short because you've refused to do what Jesus has asked you to do? What if you dropped the excuses and said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm all in. I'm in this thing. Jesus is already in my boat. He's already made himself at home. He's already stepped in, sat down, and now he's telling me to do stuff, to make some changes. Listen, get in the boat, deep in the boat. And then number three, you need to row your boat. Y'all like to have fun in church? Because you know what we need to do, right? You ready? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. That wasn't too good. I'm just going to tell you it wasn't good. But it's on the director. I, they don't let me sing in church. Row your boat. You know what row in the boat means? It means Jesus said move. So you grab the paddle and you start moving. That's what it means when you row the boat. That you said, I'm, I'm done doing it my way. We went, we tried, and we failed. I've done life my own way, but now here's Jesus. He's made himself at home. We're getting some stuff out of the boat, providing room for Jesus. Jesus says to go outwards deep because that's where the fish are. You see, he wanted to go out to the deep because that's where the opportunity was. That's where the difference happens. And he said, go to the deep, so start rowing your boat. But if you say so, that's the best part. He was very honest. Hey, Jesus, we tried that and we failed. And I don't understand what's wrong with you because I'm tired. But you know what? I don't even have the, I don't even have the strength to argue with you, Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. If you say so. In other words, I really don't want to embarrass the Son of God. You ever felt that way? Like, Jesus, I don't think you know who you're talking to. I'm going to mess this up. Jesus, I don't think you know who you're talking to. We don't have all those resources. Jesus, we don't have all the skill set. Jesus, we don't have all of the knowledge. We haven't been here before. We haven't done this before. We've got it all figured out. But Jesus said, start rowing the boat. And you're like, well, if you say so, sorry in advance, Jesus, but I'm not going to say I told you so. But if the opportunity arises, I may say I told you so. What happened this time? Somebody just, I think you ought to write that down this time. Some of you are going to miss this time because you're still worried about last time. Forget about last time, and let's talk about this time. Forget about the last time your nets came up empty. Forget about the last time you prayed and it didn't go the way you wanted it to go. Many of us, in hindsight, would look back and say, thank God it did not go the way I wanted it to go. Because God knew better than I knew. God was smarter than I am. And if your God is not smarter than you are, you're following the wrong one. Because the one true God knows more. He is more involved. He is more caring. The Bible says he's gone before you in the presence of your enemies to prepare a way for you. He is in control. So therefore, Jesus is in my boat. Before I was alone in my boat doing it in my ability, but now Jesus has invaded my space. He is in this place. And he said to go, so we started rowing the boat. And this time, the nets were so full that they begin to tear. So you go from no blessing to such a blessing that you can't even contain it. 
See, you went from so empty to so full that this time the boat is about to tip over. You're going, my God, where did these people come from? How are all these people getting saved? How is the whole city being turned upside down? Because this was the meth capital of the world. These people were addicted to drugs. These people were alcoholics. This family was falling apart. But what happened? What's the difference? Jesus got in the boat. You went out to where it was deeper. And you started rowing. Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to push us over. He's not going to knock you in the head. Jesus is going to go, I'm here. Will you let me in the boat? There's places where Jesus got out of a boat and he landed and they begged him to leave. And you remember what Jesus did? The Bible says he got back in his boat and he left. May we never be in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of greatness, in the presence of possibility of the power and the presence and the potential of God and ask Him to get back in His boat. Do you know every time Jesus sits beside you and He asks you to start rowing, to go into deeper water, and we refuse to do it, we miss everything that was on the heart of Jesus to do. But this time, it was so full the nets began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. It took more people. Such a blessing, such a miracle, such a move of God that it took more people. And they all came out to share in the blessing. And soon, both boats were so filled. Well, you know, we got enough right here to take. We don't, Pastor, we probably don't need all those campuses. Probably just ought to take care of right here. I'm thankful for this church that says, you know what? It's going to take more boats. What God is doing, it's going to take more than just this right here. It's going to take a boat over there, and it's going to take a boat over there, and who knows what God's going to do and how many boats He's going to bring over here. But as long as Jesus is in our boat, and as long as He says keep going deeper, and as long as He says keep rowing, we're going to look for boats, and we're going to fill it up, and we're going to watch the miracles of God until we're so full that we're on the verge of sinking. What if people weren't seeking in sin? What if people weren't sinking in despair and depression and hurt and all the stuff of the world? What if they were sinking in the blessing of God because of what happened in this church and because you learned to float the boat and do what Jesus said to do? Obedience opens the door to blessing. That's the key to it all right there. Why am I not receiving from God? Why am I not getting all the blessings of God? Because it's the obedience that opens the blessings of God. If my son is obedient, I'll shake the world for him. But if he's disobedient, I'm a tough dad. I am. Bud, you got to clean your room. Clean it up. Won't do it. Kept telling bud, if you don't clean it up, I'm going to throw all these toys away. One day, that's what happened. Walked in the room with a bag. Bagged them all up. And that little punk, I told you, he's sharp. You know what, Dad? You're right. Five. Those toys were old anyway. (laughs) You know what I told him? Nothing else. You get nothing else, son. Not even replacing them. Next time we're in the store, hey, Dad. Nope, don't even ask, bud. Take those tears somewhere else. We're going to work hard and we're going to learn disobedience, even partial obedience is still disobedience. But the obedience to row the boat is what opens the door to blessing in your life. Simple obedience, simple, brings supernatural blessing. Just the simple things. Let me ask you a question. What do you need to obey? How many times do we have to talk about baptism? Still not be baptized. You're not that pretty anyway. Don't worry about what your hair looks like when you come out. I mean, it's as good as it gets. I mean, not that far from messed up anyway. Put me in water, whatever. We got excuses, don't we? We're good at it. What is it that God's asking you to do? You've just been fighting to read your Bible. Come on, people. We are spoiled. Get the Bible out. It reads to you. Every day I drop my son off, 7.40 a.m. When he gets out of the car, I hit play on my Bible app. We do the Bible every year. It reads it to me. Don't look at me like I'm super spiritual. It reads it to me. It's not a lot of effort. Why aren't we giving? Why aren't we serving? What is it tonight that he told you to do? That may be why 
you're not experiencing the blessing of God. The last thing is this. You need to anchor your boat. So I thought you said start rowing. You know what happened? When they reached that sweet spot, Jesus said, stop rowing. Let the anchor down because I'm about to blow your mind. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, please forgive me. I was wrong. I'm such a sinful man. He was awestruck by the number of fish they'd caught, as were the others. Man. They were all amazed, and then Jesus said this. But I think he's saying to us tonight, don't be afraid. From now on, before you walked in here, that's past. From now on, from right now, from now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, as soon as they landed, they left everything. Tonight, what if we anchored ourselves to the purpose and the passion that God's put on your life? What if you just made room in your boat? When Jesus put you in that sweet spot, anchor yourself to it. Anchor yourself to this house. Anchor yourself to this vision. Anchor yourself to leading your family well. Anchor yourself to the simplicity of following Jesus in the very simple things. Your prayer life, your worship life, your serving life, your giving life. Look, I just believe, church, we're in a critical time in history. I've heard it all my life. Jesus could come at any minute. But I really believe it now. Not that I didn't believe it then, but like I can see it. We're the bride. He's waiting on us. Will you just bow your head, close your eyes? I just want to pray for you tonight. Two things. Number one's this. You may be here and you may know all about Jesus, but you may not have a personal relationship with him tonight. You may have been working in this church, serving, doing the things, but possibly it's not been a real life change. But tonight Jesus wants to get in your boat. He wants to get in your personal space. And I want to pray for you that this would be your time to do that. And then I want to pray for the rest of us that your life would be so arrested by passion for the things of God that you become so hungry that nothing else matters. That you'll sacrifice, you'll clear that schedule, whatever it takes for Jesus to be in that boat, to take you to deeper waters. And when He tells you to go, you start rowing. And you anchor yourself to the things that God wants to do in you and through you. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is so life-changing. Jesus, you give us such a clear picture of your goodness in our life. So Jesus, I pray tonight if there's any of us in this room without a personal relationship with you, that this would be our moment. This would be our time. We confess we've done it our own way. We've missed it. We've messed it up. God, every single one of us, 100% of us, We've fallen into sin. But because of you, Jesus, there's hope for our life. And so we confess it, we receive from you, and we devote ourselves to you. Tonight, we'll be forever different. We'll be forever changed. And God, I pray for every one of us that we wouldn't be satisfied. Jesus, that we wouldn't put more stuff in the boat to prevent us from giving you all the room and freedom that you want. And Jesus, may you take us to deeper waters. May we row every time you say go. And may we anchor to the things that make all the difference. God, I pray for this house right now. I pray that this place would be so full of fish. God, I pray that right now, God, this place, God, would be a place of healing, hope, and help like never before. God, I pray for what's to come. God, I pray for dream centers. I pray for campuses. God, not so that we can build for ourselves, but we can build the kingdom of heaven to make it one more, Father, one more place for somebody to know that Jesus loves them, cares for them, and that there's a plan and a hope for their life. And so, God, I pray for the pastors, the staff, the leadership, God, every single one of us, God, to serve and to do, to give our life for what matters, and that's for eternity. May we fall in love with you for our purpose and for our calling. God, get in the boat. Take us to deep waters. Father, we'll begin to row when you say go, and we will anchor ourselves tonight to everything you've called us to do. And Jesus, not for our name, God, may we not even be seen or known, but Jesus, may you get all the credit for everything you do 
And all God's people said, amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and celebrate Jesus tonight? Amen. Amen. They're going to sing in just one moment. But before they sing, if you'll stand with me, just I want to take a moment right now. And I want to pray. How many of you enjoyed tonight? God blessed you. God bless me. I want Shannon to just lean over and, and touch Brandon on the shoulder. And we're going to agree for Cultivate Church. They have a great church. They're doing great things. His family. Uh, his mother's going through a sickness and an illness and needs a divine touch of God right now. And we know that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we have asked or think or can even imagine. And so what I want us to do, I know this church knows how to pray. And how many of you know the same miracles that he's given us the past 10 years is the same miracle that he can give this family right now. So if you will, extend your hand this way and we're going to pray for a divine touch. Heavenly Father, God, I pray for Brandon. I pray for Jen. I pray for Asher. I pray for Kathy right now. I pray, Lord Jesus, for every part of their church and their life, God. God, let there be an anointing upon him like never before. God, let him lead so well, God. God, just a supernatural anointing upon his life. God, help him to grow and prosper and be in health, even as their soul prospers. And God, let that anointing come from the top of his head to the soul of his feet, God. God, I pray for Kat, Kathy's divine healing right now, God. God, you do a work of mercy and love. And God, just pour down your presence in that room right now. And God, we give you all the honor and the praise for what you have started, you will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. And we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. What is up, you fam? Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Pastor Todd's message was so encouraging, and we're so glad you were here for it. Don't forget, we have small group signups going on right now. The link will be listed down below. Remember, we were never meant to do live by ourselves, so make sure you get plugged into a small group. Also, if you want to rewatch this message, you can subscribe to our YouTube or follow us on Facebook. We hope you have a great week. God bless you, and we love you.